Welcome to Governing Ourselves, a Libertarian Atheist Podcast. I'm Adam. And I'm Lisa. And we're here to talk about religion, politics, life, the universe, and everything in between. And another reason why we're here is that you have such a great voice. I just like saying Oh, that. thank you. <laughs> you know, I, and I know mine is also spectacular, but yours it is, is good. particular. Yours <laughs> it is good. It's nice particular. and deep. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So now that we're getting along, let's start the show. <laughs> Yes, so this uh, this is our second episode, and this one is about our journey from Mormonism to atheism. Yes. Yep. So how about you start, Adam? Um, oh. Yeah, so um, so you start off. So we, we both grew up in the church. Yes, we did. Yes. Did your parents grow up in the church, or were they converts? Um, y- yes-ish. So my mother, she comes from... A long line of Mormonism, uh, you know, pioneer ancestry. Mm-hmm. There's probably a little polygamy in the back there somewhere. Um, my dad, however, is a little bit more spotty. Um, his mother was a member of the church. Uh, his father never converted in life. Mm-hmm. Um, in life. In, in life. I know, right? That's the residual programming still sort of showing its head there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so my... My dad uh, joined the church, and most of my family members are are members of the church. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, my father served a mission. Uh, he met uh, my mother at Brigham Young University, and uh, I was born in Provo, Utah, mm. uh, which I don't usually like to admit to, but <laughs> since we're being really honest here. And of course, uh, because of these things, you know, I would be destined to follow in their footsteps and 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 spread the the good word of the reestablishment of the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. Mm. But what was not expected is that eventually, you know, I'd have big problems. So before I go get in too deep, maybe let's do a little childhood introduction for your journey. Sure. Um both my parents were converts to the church. They uh they met, they got married. Um, and I was, so yeah, I've, I've been raised in the church. Um, I, I always looked at it like it was the truth, you know, just like with a lot of, um, belief systems. If you grow up being taught certain things as if they were true, you believe it and you look at the world that way. And so for most of my life, I looked through, um, the Mormon lens and I was okay with it sometimes. Um, there were lots of times where I struggled, even though I still believed it was true. Um, that doesn't mean it was easy and that doesn't mean it was pleasant, but that's, so that, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. And I think we both uh, share some of that experience. You know, we probably both went to primary. We did. Um, Yep. I did not like primary, even as a child. Mm. Um, I thought it was too much singing, and I wanted to get into, um, you know, actually studying the material, even from a oh. young age. Wow. Yeah. No, I was I was intellectually bored. Uh, not that I, you know, I'm not this, like, intellectual smart guy, but, you know, I just, I feel like a lot of religion is a bit patronizing, right? You know, it's a bit, um, you know, sort of talks down to you. Hmm. And, you know, even as a kid, I, I could pick up on that. And uh, and I didn't like that stuff. I wanted to get into the nitty gritty. I wanted to talk about, um, you know, colob and oh. um, and everything else. And, and the teachers would all sort of get nervous and like, what if we <laughs> sing about colors? You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah, try to for me, it was like the that. opposite. I'm like that now. Oh. Um, but ah. as, as a primary kid, I, I liked the songs. You know, I liked I singing. I liked, I liked the music. And I still do. You know, music is very much, it's, it's important to me. Well, we can get into a lot of that later, too, because there, there's right. some... Maybe we're getting over-detailed here. Yes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there's a Mormon subculture. Let's just say that. And, and, and there's plenty out there to learn about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway... We'll be covering uh, a lot of it. Yeah, that's true. We were both baptized at eight. We both went through primary. Both went through our, our various classes. Um, 
I was given the priesthood authority at age 12. Lisa was not because she's a girl. Mm -hmm. And so explain uh, what the priesthood authority is. So, uh, you know, basically the, the question is like, who has really the right to baptize you? Who has the right to give you blessings to perform various, you know, rituals and ordinances? Well, uh, the Mormon church believes that, um, their line of authority can be traced uh, all the way uh, to Joseph Smith and then to Jesus Christ. Um, you know, so Mormons would, would view other baptisms and other faiths as uh, invalid because they have no actual divine authority to administer uh, in, in the name of God. Um, we give every young man this opportunity at age, uh, at age 12. And, you know, again, well, let's, you know, kind of skip it to the end, right? Like, so, uh, of, uh, and the expectation for, for young men in the church is to eventually go on a mission, um, which I did. Uh, I went on a mission to the south of France. And it's for two whole years. Two whole years. It's full time. Mm-hmm. You get to call home uh, twice a year, yeah. uh, one it, once for Mother's Day and once for uh, Christmas. Um and uh, so anyway, uh, I finished that up. I, I do. Uh, I did learn to speak French. My French is pretty bad now, but mm. but uh, I can still get by. Nice. Um. So you know, not a, not a total loss. <laughs> yeah. You got to Ate visit another country. You got to learn a new yeah. language. Yeah. Lots of good I food, did. huh? Oh my God! It's it's tremendous. It's just out of this <laughs> world. Um. Yeah. And then you know, came home. Go to the singles ward. The next expectation is to find a wife. Yes. And I did manage to to do that. Uh, We were married in the temple. Um, And then before I go on to, you know, where it all went wrong, maybe (laughs) we could catch up on your life up to this point. Sure. Um, So, yeah, I grew up in the church. Um, I believed it was true my whole life until I didn't. Um, which was, um, no, no. So I grew up believing that it was true and I tried to be obedient to what the book of Mormon said that God wanted us to do. Um, a big, big thing is follow the prophet and the Mormon church is kind of unique in that they think that they have a living prophet. They have someone who's living on the earth who gets direct revelation from God on how to govern the church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, I don't know what number the church is on now, but, um, but that's one of the things is you're expected to follow the prophet that because he receives modern revelation for his people, that you're expected to follow what he says. And, you know, I tried to do that and I still struggled, but I still believe that it was true. The first time that I, well, there was one time before I left for college, where I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in a cult. Um, That only happened one time, (laughs) and that was during a temple dedication. Um, Yeah. The the Hosanna shout. Oh my gosh, I can talk about that later. Um, But that that came and went. So uh, the first time when I really started to look at the religion and be like, what do I believe was when I went away to college. I was no longer Mm -hmm. living with my parents. I was no longer in the, you know, the area I grew up in. And so, you know, I, I could start over, you know, I could just start from scratch. And so I did. And I thought, what do I believe? And I had some, some real struggles throughout my, my college years, but I managed to, um, talk myself out of disbelief. Um, I was able to rationalize in my mind enough so that I would be okay with it. Um, Specifically things like polygamy. Um, And yeah, polygamy was a huge thing that I I struggled believing. Um, And yeah, I think there were a few others, but that was that was a big one. Oh, another one was the temple. Um, I, so I met my husband and we started dating and 
you know, we wanted to get married in the temple. We were both members of the church at the time. And that's still something that I wanted to do. You're taught that that's what you should want. You're taught that, you know, like the, the epitome of your, your spiritual life is to be worthy to go to the temple. To take out your endowments, which is a ceremony that you do. Um, and it's something that I wanted to do. But I I struggled so much that they don't tell you beforehand what you can expect in the temple. They And it's on purpose. Um, and I was frustrated. I took... Um, I took classes, the temple preparatory classes, trying to find out, okay, what can I expect? You know, what am I getting into? I, I was told that we're going to make promises with God, but I didn't know what they were. So and very vague. Very much so. And I read the, the temple preparation booklet that they have, and I was like, you know, I'm looking for stuff. What am I going to be saying in the temple? What kind of promises am I going to be making with God in there? You yeah, know, there's a whole class that tells you nothing. Yes. And the booklet told me nothing. It, it just over and over again. Now remember, it's all symbolic. I was like, <laughs> I get it. It's symbolic. But what am I in for? Um, I was able to, again, just talk myself into being okay with that. So right. um, I did get married mm-hmm. civilly. Um, but at the time, I wasn't ready to go into the temple. You know, I wasn't okay with it yet. And my husband, to his credit, you know, he said, it's okay. You know, if you're not ready to go to the temple now or in five years, it's okay. I just want to start a life with you. Aww. That's nice. It was. That that was so important to me. And, (laughs) And so we did, you know, over the next year, I was able to... (sighs) to come to terms with stuff and be ready to go to the temple. So then we were sealed in the temple a year later. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's where that happened. So um, (laughs) things kind of, I wouldn't say went downhill from there, but (laughs) that's um, no, no, my, my husband was great and our marriage was really good. Um, But the church thing that I was seriously struggling with again. And so that's where I'll leave off for now. Um, so you go ahead. Where did you start to, I guess, doubt or listen to your doubts about the church? Yeah, I wasn't exactly sure where to start because I think, I think we all have some doubts, Mm -hmm. you know, as, as we grow up and, and, you know, especially, you know, non LDS, but religious children tend to be unkind to LDS children. Mm. And at least that was my experience. You know, I was, I was always being told I was going to hell and, Hmm. and that sort of thing by the, the more traditional Christian faith, you know, around me. Um, you know, uh, I had a friend, uh, who, you know, we got along great and we, we really liked each other, but eventually their folks were like, you can't hang out with him anymore because he's a Mormon. Um, Hmm. you know, there's certainly other classes of people that are far more persecuted than than mormons are but you know i had heard a lot of these voices but anytime i heard a voice that was in direct opposition i would i would cling harder and i would i would get more defensive and i would i I think in a lot of ways these things I, i don't know if i should say strengthened my faith because ultimately i believe something that wasn't true and even joseph smith would define true faith as something where you have the thing that you believe in has to actually be real. Hmm. So by his own definition, I guess I didn't actually have faith, but anyway, um, you believed it was true, but I believed it was true. And, and the more people fought me, the more I thought it was true. Yeah. Because that's, that's evidence that Satan is trying to overthrow (laughs) the church. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's trying to, he's trying to stop you and you know, that kind of makes you feel cool, you know, like, oh, even Satan's trying to stop me, you know, yeah. I must be, I must be hot shit, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, I think, uh, one of the big doubts would have started also with the temple, uh, now that you got me thinking about it, right? So before I was able to go on my mission, I had to, uh, do, you know, take out my endowment, which is like a whole other process yeah and when i got in there the ceremonies uh weirded me out mm. um you know they have the the washington the washing and anointing ceremony uh which was very uncomfortable 
Um, and then the endowment session itself was, you know, sort of tame enough. Um, but then at the end, you know, you kind of all get into one room called the celestial room, um, to sort of hang out with each other Mm -hmm. and just, you know, enjoy some quiet time, which was always my, my, my favorite part of the experience because it it would just get so quiet and it's such a pretty room. Yeah. It's always beautiful. Um, but I, you know, when you're going through the ceremony, you have to wear these temple clothing Mm -hmm. and, uh, seeing my parents, uh, on a bench, you know, in that room dressed this way. I also had that epiphany moment of, oh my God, it's a cult. Oh. Right. And, you know, just like you, I rationalized it. Yeah. Right. Eventually I was able to rationalize it because look, you, you don't want to just throw everything out the window day one. Mm-hmm. Right. You, you don't want to lose your parents. You don't want to lose your community and everyone else that you've known and has supported you throughout your life. And so the easiest thing to do is to convince yourself that it's okay. Yeah. And so I was able to do that a lot. Uh, I experienced doubts on my mission, but I think there was just enough opposition that it, it kept my fire kind of burning. Um, but, you know, in the quiet moments when I was really left to myself, perhaps in a night where I could not sleep, you know, I would truly question these things. Mm. And, um, you know, then rationalize and rationalize and rationalize. Yeah. I got home from my mission, um, you know, went to the singles ward and, uh, you know, I went to school in San Francisco Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course no one there is religious, much less Mormon. (laughs) And so I had plenty of opposition and, and I think that, that really helped me to stay in the church for a long time. Uh, cause the more people fought me, like if I had just gone to BYU, like I was supposed to, you know, I probably would have left earlier <laughs> Oh, <laughs> cause I hate it when everyone agrees with me. Um, but hence the libertarianism. Mm. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, you know, got married in the temple, got married in the Oakland temple. Um, and then around that time though, I, I would say about a year later, no, it would have been the same year because it was 2008. Um, the the ward, the new family ward I was in uh, after I was married, started passing around bumper stickers and signs. And these had to do with uh, California's Proposition 8. Oh, yes. All right. The the gay marriage ban. Now, yep. al- although I had held on to my religious beliefs, my politics had changed quite a bit. And... Um, you will talk about that more next time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, long story short, I, you know, I am for gay rights. Um, and I believe, you know, in, you know, uh, marriage equality and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I did not appreciate being expected to uh, go against that in, in church. And I felt it was inappropriate for the church to be involved. And, and I think that seeing, something that I viewed as an imperfection in the church made me really start questioning it. Because as you mentioned earlier, Lisa, the, the, the LDS faith is a little bit different in that they believe that there is a current prophet. There is a direct line to revelation. Yes. Because of this, I would not allow the church in my mind to make certain mistakes. Right. If the Catholic Church changed its mind, I, I would understand that. Mm. If another church changed its mind on something, I would understand that. But when the LDS Church would change its mind, that wouldn't compute for me. Yeah. Uh, because, again, you have that direct line of, of connection. And I felt like, you know, either God is, you know, persecuting these people or we've got it wrong. And, you know, sort of still holding on to my belief at the time in God you know, I, I started having problems with Mormonism specifically. Mm. Um, but I think even more importantly than that, cause I still held on for a while, uh, was I, you know, my attendance started to drop a little bit and my your church attendance, re- my church attendance would started to, to sort of languish a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, my reading of the scriptures was languishing. 
uh, I was still praying nightly, but I was pretty much only doing it at night. Mm-hmm. Um, Instead of that, morning and night. That lack of self-indoctrination that they want you to do, that all churches want you to do, uh, but perhaps the Mormon church in particular. Um, I think they're more extreme with it, yeah. They gave me the opportunity to, you know, silence the programming enough that my my mind could kind of gasp for air hmm. and and reach that surface. Um, combine that with my journey towards libertarianism, uh, and I discovered uh, the uh, the words of Pendulette. <laughs> oh yes, I'm a big Pendulette fan, uh, and in one of his books, he 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 talks about the Abraham story. And uh, I'm 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 gonna paraphrase, but I'm probably gonna butcher it. But he basically says, uh, you know, if if God, you know, told you to to kill your son for him, you know, would you do it? And if the answer is no, you might be an atheist. Oh. You know, and if the answer is yes, please reconsider. Hmm. And I and I thought about it, and and I kind of put it out of my mind for a while, but. When my son was born, that's when things really started to fall apart for me. As far uh, as your because faith? Because as far as my faith goes. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you, you hold that helpless child in your arm, something happens to you. And, uh, and I'm sorry to my daughter that this didn't happen for her. I guess I was still just too indoctrinated at the time. Mm-hmm. But when my son was born... Um, you know, I looked at the baby and I, and I asked myself that, that same question and I knew the answer was no, you know, I knew that I could never do it mm-hmm. and it still took time, but eventually I realized that, you know, I was an atheist. Yeah. That if God told you to kill your son, you wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. And, and that anyone that would, that, that would do it is either hearing voices or they're just, you know insane or or way too zealous because especially in the in in a post 9 11 world Mm -hmm. when you're thinking about you know religious people killing themselves for for jihad or whatever i mean what's the difference what's really the difference um you know i don't think there is a discernible difference Mm -hmm. and at least not one that isn't rife with rationalizations and excuses you know and that's really what it kind of comes down to you know, at a certain point, you just have to stop making excuses. And you have to say, you know what? If these truths are plain and precious, as Nephi says, then that's just what they're going to be. Yeah. And it's going to make sense to you. And you're going to be able to defend them logically. And at a certain point, you just have to say, you know, am I am I creating truth or am I trying to find it? So you you went from that point where you looked at your son and you said, if God told me to kill him, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. You know, that feels like it's a rebellion against a God that you might still believe in. Yes, it was. And so where did you cross the line from being willing to rebel against God to believing that or to doubting that he exists at all? I, I started reading, um, I think, God Know, <laughs> which I know is mainly supposed to just be comedy. Mm. Um, but it it actually really struck me. And um, I had some atheist friends. Um, I work in education. Um, and uh, the science teachers there, of course, were, <laughs> were atheists. Mm. Uh, is it a good science teacher? Probably should be. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I... You know, I, I was leaving slowly and, uh, you know, they introduced me to a world that was not alone. And I think that that knowing I wasn't alone um, helped me take that first step. Mm. But it was it was a slow burn. I don't know if I can pinpoint a moment where I finally was like, I'm an atheist. Holy shit. You yeah. know, I, I th- just when it came to my son, I think I was like, I might be an atheist. Mm hmm. You know, but when that became definitely, I, I don't remember. Yeah. It is kind of a slow, a slow realization. It was that for me too. Yeah. 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 For me, when, when I was married, 
Um, I, I would be in church, sitting there in sacrament meeting, which is the first of the three hours of church. Um, so I'd be sitting in sacrament meeting and listening to the speaker, and <clears throat> I couldn't stop critically thinking about what they were saying. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's normal to just sit there and like just sort of, you know, yeah, this is all of its stuff I've heard before, you know, just yeah. sort of let it wash over you. Um, but I would be sitting there with my husband, um, who's nodding off. <laughs> um, and I'd just right. be thinking about what the speakers are saying and actually evaluating, like, are they right? You know, is mm -hmm. it true? And um, I was frustrated with myself that that's what I was doing, that I couldn't stop thinking critically. And it's so strange to me now that I was frustrated that that was the case. I was frustrated <laughs> that I couldn't turn off my thinking brain and just right. in, just enjoy <laughs> church the way that I used to. Um, yeah. The thing that started me on the path to leaving the church was, it's actually a Sunday school lesson. Um, I was sitting in Sunday school and the lesson was about Emma Smith, who is Joseph Smith's wife. Uh, first wife. First, first wife. <laughs> first wife. Yes. Um, and you know, it was, it was, it was probably the lesson on Doctrine and Covenants section twenty-five, which is like the music, the hymn book one, the one that's directed to Emma. Um, I leaned over to the guy next to me, and because a thought struck me, so I leaned over to him and I was like, "When Joseph Smith died, did Emma remarry a Mormon?" And he mm. he shook his head and he was like, "No." And I was like, huh. And so then I wanted to learn more about her. You know, mm. what, because we know so little about her. Um, yeah. I know that a few, you know, she married Joseph Smith against her father's wishes. Right. Um, they... So listen to your folks, people. <laughs> <laughs> Honor thy father and mother. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, she and Joseph had a lot of children and quite a few of them died. Um, and she lived through her husband being persecuted by non-members. Um, and so she went through a lot, you know, and I, I wanted to know what was it like to be the wife of the first prophet? But there were a few books, some were like, you know, oh, Emma and Joseph, the, the match made in heaven, you know, the, oh, the couple yeah. that was meant to be. And I'm like, no. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm looking for. That has yeah. bias written all over it. I wanted Desert something... Desert book. Yes, yes. I wanted something more objective, something more factual. Right. And I came across a book. It's called A Mormon Enigma, Emma Hale Smith. Mm -hmm. And it had it had a little too much of a, a narrative feel to it. I was looking for something that was more, you know, strictly... Um, Nonfiction. Yes, and you know they took a few um, a few liberties here and there with storytelling, but there was and they covered polygamy extensively in the book because poor Emma was right in the middle of it. She's married to the prophet, and he's going off to get sealed to other women, to get married to other women. He's having sex with other women. Right. You know, she's smack in the middle of that. And so they, they tried to, the authors tried their best to cover, you know, just her and her story. And there was just enough in there, in the book, to make me realize that my doubts about the church were valid. Mm -hmm. You know, especially my extreme dislike of the idea of polygamy in the early church. Mm -hmm. There were a couple other things in the book um, that they brought up, and I was like, okay, that makes sense. I looked up a couple of their references. They they were fairly thorough with citing their sources, um, and so I looked up a couple of them, and yeah, they're, they they quoted it correctly. Right. Um, and from there, I just kept reading. You know, I kept, I it was it was like that book gave me permission. It, I gave myself permission to start researching further. And so I did. And I started researching non-Mormon sources. And that's a big thing about the church. And we can cover this more in another topic. But the church is, it discourages its members from finding information from non-Mormon sources, from sources outside the church. Um, they, they label anything that's negative about the church as anti-Mormon propaganda. 
Right. And they're very vocal about that in church. You know, it's anti-Mormon propaganda. It's, it's, you know, orchestrated by Satan to try and get your soul, essentially, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as Mormons, largely faithful Mormons, you don't go researching stuff outside the church. You know, you keep it to, if you're researching a Sunday school lesson or a Relief Society or priesthood lesson, you go to the church website and Mm -hmm. look up talks that previous uh, church leaders have given. You know, you look in the scriptures, you look in the Ensign, which is the church's magazine for adults. Um, You know, you keep your research to those topics, to those sources. But... I finally gave myself permission to look at what other people were saying about the church. And what I ended up doing is I finally sat down and I made a list. I wrote down all of the things that I either never really believed about the church or things that I used to believe, but I no longer did. Mm. And I think it was like a, there was like, like 21 things on the list. Wow. 21. Yes. It was, it was a lot. So it all started with you reading. It started then... with me researching more about the church and about church history. And then history. it got worse when you started writing. Yes. <laughs> and that's why, kids, if you run a religion, don't let women read or write. Oh, um... slap, slap, slap. <laughs> so the... what were some of those things on those on that list? I'm curious. Uh, the, the belief that um, there are three kingdoms of glory. In the Mormon religion, they teach it's not a simple heaven or hell. They teach that once you die, your spirit either goes to spirit paradise or spirit prison, which is what other Christians would call heaven or hell. But then after that, that's sort of like a waiting period for you to be judged for your actions. And once you've been judged, then you'll go to, then your spirit will be reunited with your body. Um, after the second coming of Jesus. And you will go to one of three kingdoms of glory. The first is the celestial kingdom. The second one is the terrestrial kingdom. And the third one is the telestial. And then there's outer darkness. That's basically eternal punishment, damnation, whatever. Mm-hmm. Only, only you know, the worst of the worst will go there. Right. Um, and so I... I looked at that and I was like, if that is true, if there are three kingdoms of glory, why is it that God is only telling people about that in the 1830s? Everywhere else, in the Bible, in the Book of Mormon even, it's called heaven and hell. Right. So if if there really were three kingdoms of glory, why is it that we're just now hearing about it in the 1830s? or 1840s, Mm. whenever that revelation came about. Right. So that was one of the things. Like, if that's true, why haven't we heard about it before? Why hasn't God explained it to anybody before now? So when when you get into questions about the Mormon faith in in general, Mm -hmm. uh, because nothing you you just said about, about that particular point refutes, you know, Christianity in general. And a lot of my Christian friends... You know what I would tell them? I'm an atheist. They'd say, well, uh, they would say, well, your problem, of course, is not Christianity or God. Your problem is Mormonism. Mm. So why don't, why don't you just come to church with us, you know, or why don't you figure out what we've got going on? Yeah. You know, so why why don't we just go mainstream, um, uh, you know, Christian? Why, why jump straight to atheism? What would your response be for that? Well, I didn't jump straight to atheism. Um, mm. so the, the final straw for me for leaving the church, I, I officially left. Um, I, I wrote a letter of resignation to the church and, um, I said, you know, basically I'm out, I'm done. Um, the thing that did it for me was I read a New York times article about a man named Hans Matson. Um, I think he's Swedish, so I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. My apologies. Mm. Um, but in the article, it's, he was an area authority over in Sweden, and mm. he, um, he was a faithful member. He began getting questions from members who were finding things out about the church on the internet, and they're like, well, like what's going on? You know, over there, they'd never heard that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. 
They never heard it before. Yeah. There's stuff... People in France have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of those members over there hadn't. And so they came to him and, you know, he didn't have answers. And so he went to... Um, the you know his superiors in the church and he asked questions and he got a bunch of evasive answers um and right. so he began doing research for himself and he was like it, it basically his foundation began to crumble mm -hmm. you know and um in the article i have it somewhere where did it go um in the article he said that a member of the quorum of the 12 apostles came there and told the you know let me find it really quick because i don't want to misquote it and the article is called some mormons search the web and find doubt mm -hmm. yeah so i found the the specific quote in the article so okay it says mr matson said he sought the help of the church's highest authorities he said a senior apostle came to sweden at his request and told a meeting of mormons that he had a manuscript in his briefcase that once it was published would prove all the doubters wrong but mr matson said the promised text never appeared and when he asked the apostle about it he was told it was impertinent to ask and then mm. in parentheses it says, Mr. Madsen refused to identify the apostle, but others said it was Elder L. Tom Perry, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Elder Perry, mm. now 91, which was, you know, back in 2013, confirmed through a church spokesman that he did visit a branch in Sweden with skeptical members, but said he recalled satisfying their questions with a letter written by the church's history department. So that... Mm those two paragraphs right there i was like okay someone's lying and it's probably the people who have more to lose mm -hmm. you know and then so you know they said that you know there's a manuscript in the briefcase that once it was published would prove all the doubters wrong but then mr matson said the promised text never appeared and when he asked the apostle about it he was told it was impertinent to ask and so right there, that's when I was like, I'm done. I'm out. Mm -hmm. I yeah, am out. You can't, you, you can't have mistakes like that. No. You know? Nope. And so I, I was like, <sighs> that's so what, did you that's. Go deist for a while. I did. did you go... I did. See, yeah. that's, that's when I, it took me a little while to leave the church because I, I considered staying only for the social aspect of it because right. the For church family. yes the church is a very close-knit society um and most of my friends were mormon my entire family is mormon and my husband's entire family um so like all my friends mo all my family they're mormon and i considered i was like okay i don't believe this anymore can i still go to church for the social aspect can I still go to church and sit through three hours of meetings knowing that I don't believe this stuff anymore right. just for the social aspect? And I realized I couldn't. And yeah, I think I tried to do that for a while too. Yeah. You know, and I no longer wanted my record in the church to count towards their total membership number. Because every year in General Conference, which is the worldwide broadcast, uh, it's twice a year, in the spring, in April, they give the statistics of the church, which is, you know, how many members do we have? How many um, children were baptized? How many missionaries do we have? You know, how many missions are there in the church worldwide? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want my membership record to count towards that total of theirs which I think now is like 16 million. It's not that big. No, not, I mean, you, you could easily guess that it's less than half of that just from inactivity alone. Yeah, yeah. The number of active members of the church is much, much less. Yeah. Um, much, so, much less. yeah, so that was my story. That's that's what started it, started the 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 path to leaving. And, you know, the, now, New, what was the that New York again? Times, 16? about 16 million. You know, what, one thing that bummed me out when I was in college was, I, I you know, I played a lot of World of Warcraft, mm. and, I, and I thought, oh my god, World of Warcraft, in it's like, at the time, like, three or four years of existing, mm -hmm. 
you know, had twice as many members as the church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then, and most of those would have been active. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's it. That was, uh, that was my journey from, well, so that was my journey out of Mormonism. Um, then how do we get to atheism? I, at first I thought, okay, the Mormon church is not true, you know? There's a bunch of lying going on. There's hiding information. There's, you know, um, but could it be that other churches are true? That other churches more align with what I still believe? Because I still believed God exists. You know, I still believed in the Mormon version of God, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a kind, loving Heavenly Father. Um, but in the, that didn't last very long because in the church, they uh, they have no problem um, pointing out how other religions are wrong, you know, right. s especially the Catholic Church. Um, from there, it was it was just um, slowly disbelieving God. I think a big a big influence was um, Richard Dawkins' book, his uh, the God Delusion. Right. You know. Yeah. Because it's it's a lot of science in the book. You know, he talks about religion, of course, and God especially. Um, but there's a lot of science in there. And, you know, I slowly came to realize that, you know, science has the answers to a lot of things that religion also gives an answer for as God, but also stuff that they don't have answers for. You know, that science is, it's not, it's not the, the, it's not a bad thing, according to the Mormons, but it's inferior to faith. Mm -hmm. Science and a scientific mind is inferior to a faith-filled mind. Right. Wisdom of, of man versus wisdom of God. Yes. Right. And so, yeah, it's just slowly realizing that, you know, God, that these, the arguments that, that, um, that God-believing people have for God, you know, they can be debunked. They can be, they can be disputed with science. So I have a question for you, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, now that you are an atheist, mm -hmm. uh, how many people have you uh, raped and killed? <laughs> None. <laughs> None. <laughs> and I no, don't no. want to either. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to, huh? That's no. so weird. That's so weird. I didn't want to either, and I and I haven't and I haven't done any of that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> but I was assured that that's what would happen. Um, uh, that's what religion wants to paint atheists as. You know that they're right. immoral, or even amoral. That they that yeah, because they don't believe in God, they reject all morals because morals come from God, and so, so they'll rape, kill, steal. You know anything they want because they're not afraid of eternal consequences so so then where where do good values come from well that's another thing i liked about richard dawkins book is that he talks about that the the mm. origins of morality um you know it comes it boils down to survival instincts you know mm. survival we got this far because we learned how to work together you know, right. what's best for the group, what's best for our tribe, you know, way back in the day, you know, mm -hmm. thousands, millions of years ago. Um, you know, you learn to work together and concepts of sharing, you know, concepts of you don't kill people, you know, that are in your tribe. You know, you get these, these morals and these values because that has led to survival, that's led to yeah. our our tr our species surviving so long. Richard Dawkins says it way better than I do, and that oh, sure. that was like a that was like a, a, a like a very small nutshell. Um, but that's that's one of the things I liked about his book a lot is because he addresses that, and he gives an explanation for where it comes from. You know, you run into a huge problem when you talk about morals coming from God, because which God are you talking about? You know, Allah is very different from Yahweh. 
you know, from yes, the true. from the Christian God. They are so so different. That's that's when we have to go full Jordan Peterson and say, well, that depends on. It depends what on you mean. what you mean by religion. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by God. Yes. Yeah. Now, to to be fair, I'm a big fan. We both enjoy his work, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's yeah. fun to make fun of him. Yeah, there. Yeah, some of his uh, his figures of speech. Yeah. But 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 I mean it in love. Okay. <laughs> so please don't get upset. Um, yeah. All right. Um. So that is pretty much our time. In fact, we're a little over time. Mm-hmm. And um, next time we are going to talk about our journey uh, politically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from here on out after that, we'll we'll start sort of meshing the two. Yes, uh, yes. There, in a way that... there are different topics, you know, religious topics, uh, political topics, you know, faith, obedience, uh, control abortion, immigration, marijuana, you know, a lot of stuff that's, that's current to us right now. But our our real goal in the long run is, again, to learn to govern ourselves, like to Mm -hmm. talk about how to, how to better our lives and how to, you know, live without these authorities, um, you know, controlling our lives. Yeah. Um, And so that's what we're here to do. If you want something that is a bit more aggressive. I might suggest the scathing atheist or mm-hmm. something else. Yeah, or Mister um, Atheist on yes. YouTube. He's he's former Mormon, um, and he also had a problem with Prop Eight, and I mm. and that was part of the journey that we shared. Yeah, that, you know, from what I've seen from his stuff. Yeah, but our um, tone, our tone, what we want from this podcast, as far as tone, is more, um, more factual. You know, <clears throat> um, not as not angry. Right. You know, I, I went through an angry period when I first left the church, but I'm yeah. not there anymore. You know, I'm, I want to look at things from, from an outside point of view, but also just more factual. Right. We're, we're done with the, with the knee jerk rebellion phase. And now mm-hmm. we want to talk about, you know, well, what's next and, and how do we manage? Yeah. And, and I feel that way politically too. So yeah, hopefully you will, uh, you know, find you know, value in, in, in our contemplations and in our, our efforts to, to better how we govern ourselves. Yep. Yep. And if you have questions for us, I forget if I mentioned this last time, but, you know, I am going to be posting this, um, the podcast episodes on uh, YouTube as well. And I've got a Facebook page and a Twitter page as well. So if you have questions for us that you want us to cover in in future episodes, let us know. You yeah. know, and and we'll we'll probably have a question and answer session. Um, yeah, probably once a month. I or hope so. we do. Yeah, me too. I hope. Until then, thank you for listening, folks. Stay free and stay skeptical. <laughs>